What is going on everybody? It's Medicosis Perfectionatus where medicine makes perfect sense. Welcome back to my endocrinology playlist. In previous videos we talked about the endocrine glands and the embryological origins of these glands. We talked about the hypothalamus, the anterior pituitary, the posterior pituitary, the thyroid gland, the parathyroid glands, the adrenal cortex, the adrenal medulla, the endocrine pancreas. Then we discussed the endocrine hormones such as growth hormone, prolactin, oxytocin, antidiuretic hormone, FSH, LH, TSH, and ACTH, thyroid hormones, parathyroid hormone, aldosterone, cortisol, adrenal androgens, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine, insulin, glucagon, and somatostatin, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, antihydrotestosterone. After which we discussed the endocrine pathologies such as pituitary adenomas, prolactinomas, craniopharyngiomas, hypopituitarism, dwarfism, gigantism, acromegaly, hyperthyroidism versus hypothyroidism, Graves' disease versus Hashimoto thyroiditis, Kahn syndrome, Cushing syndrome, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, phacromocytoma, Addison's disease, insulinoma, glucagonoma, VIPoma, somatostatinoma, and gastrinoma. The last video was about hypoglycemia. Today we shall discuss hyperglycemia, a condition of elevated blood sugar. What are the causes? What are the symptoms? How can we diagnose it and how can we treat it? Let's find out. Click the like button, click the subscribe button before I get thirsty. This is my endocrinology playlist. Please watch these videos in order for maximum understanding and retention, not to be confused with my patient's urine retention. Here is the classic story of Endocrine Inc. Your endocrine system has a CEO and underneath you have a general manager, a bunch of employees which have to listen to the general manager and some independent contractors which do not care about the general manager. If you wish to see more videos like this in the future, please drop your favorite occupation emoji in the comments. The CEO of Endocrine Inc. is your hypothalamus. The GM is the pituitary gland, specifically the anterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary can influence your thyroid gland, your adrenal cortex, and the gonads because these are the three employees. How about the independent contractors which do not listen to the pituitary? Parathyroid instead of thyroid, adrenal medulla instead of cortex, pancreas instead of gonads. But how does the GM talk to the employees? How does the anterior pituitary talk to the thyroid gland? By means of thyroid stimulating hormone, which is a hormone that stimulates the thyroid gland. How does the pituitary talk to the adrenal cortex? By ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone the hormone that talks to the cortex of the adrenal. And how does the anterior pituitary influence the gonads? By means of FSH and LH, the follicle-stimulating hormone and the luteinizing hormone. Today we're talking about hyperglycemia. Insulin is not under the influence of the pituitary. Glucagon is not under the influence of the pituitary. Epinephrine is not under the influence of the pituitary. But cortisol is under the influence of the pituitary. And cortisol can control blood sugar. Too much cortisol causes too much blood sugar. Whereas a decrease in cortisol is going to drop your blood sugar. Next, the most important topic in biochemistry. The insulin world versus the glucagon world. Insulin stan versus glucagon stan. Insulin world versus glucagon world. Insulin is anabolic, but glucagon is catabolic. What does anabolic mean? To build up and catabolic to break down. This is where you get the word catastrophe from. It's a total breakdown. And this is where you get the word anatomy from, which means to cut you up. I will never do this to you because I love you. Insulin is a builder. Glucagon is a destroyer. Insulin is the hero of the feeding state, but glucagon is the hero of the fasting state. Not just fasting, but fasting and starvation. Insulin land, glucagon land. Anabolic, catabolic. Anabolism, catabolism, endergonic, exergonic, needs energy. Energy goes into the system, which means it requires ATP, it absorbs ATP. But the process of catabolism is exergonic, where energy is expelled. It releases ATP. Feeding state versus fasting state. What do you mean when you say insulin is anabolic? It's protein anabolic, glycogen anabolic, and fat anabolic. It's going to build up proteins, it's going to build up glycogen, and it's going to build up triglycerides. How do you build up proteins from amino acids? Hashtag proteogenesis or protein synthesis. How do you build up glycogen? 
from glucose, hashtag glycogenesis or glycogen synthesis. Say thank you to your glycogen synthase. How do you build up triglycerides from free fatty acids, hashtag lipogenesis or lipid synthesis? Say hi to acetyl-CoA carboxylase, please. How about glucagon? And by the way, it's not just glucagon, it's glucagon and his friends. Who are glucagon's friends? cortisol, epinephrine, and to a certain extent, thyroxine. These hormones tend to be catabolic. Glucagon is gonna break down your proteins into amino acids, hashtag proteolysis or proteolysis. Take some of these amino acids and convert them to glucose. This is called gluconeogenesis. Genesis is formation of glucose from new sources. Gluconeogenesis, what do you mean by new sources? Non-carbohydrate sources, oh, that's new. It is new to make glucose from amino acids, to make sugar from proteins. That's new. What is old? To make sugar from sugar, glucose from glycogen, small sugar from breaking down big sugar. How do you break down the big glycogen to small glucose? By glycogenolysis. Say hi to glycogen phosphorylase. Glucagon is fat catabolic. It breaks down the big fat triglycerides into smaller fat, free fatty acids. Hashtag lipolysis, say thank you to your hormone-sensitive lipase. Anytime you break down fat, ketone bodies are going to emerge, and this is called ketogenesis. What are the ketone bodies in the human body? Three main ones. Acetone, acetoacetic acid, and beta-hydroxybutyric acid. If you wish to download these doozy colorful notes, go to metacosisperfectionatus.com. I help you learn, understand, and pass exams. If you want me to personally tutor you, reach out to me on my website. Charles Dickens said, It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. It was the land of anabolism, it was the land of catabolism, it was the age of proteogenesis, it was the age of proteolysis, it was the epoch of lipogenesis, it was the epoch of lipolysis, it was the season of glycogenesis, it was the season of glycogenolysis, it was the spring of anti-ketosis, it was the winter of ketone bodies. So when insulin goes up, your blood glucose decreases because insulin pushes the glucose into the cells and away from the blood. But when glucagon is high, your blood sugar will rise. And this is called hyperglycemia. So insulin causes hypoglycemia, but glucagon causes hyperglycemia. Why don't they teach biochemistry like this in medical school? because most professors cannot tell the difference between their butthole and a hole in the ground. So here is normal insulin function, which is anabolic, of course, and here's what happens when I lack insulin activity in case of diabetes mellitus, whether I lack insulin itself in type 1 diabetes or whether I have a problem in the insulin receptor in type 2 diabetes. Normally, insulin is anabolic on glycogen. It increases glycogen synthesis, which means it converts glucose to glycogen, lowering the blood sugar. But when I have diabetes, the opposite happens. I raise the blood sugar, it's hyperglycemia, which causes non-enzymatic glycation, which damages all kinds of structures, such as blood vessels. This is diabetic vasculopathy, which can lead to diabetic nephropathy, neuropathy, and retinopathy. It's like tell me you're sophisticated without actually telling me. To learn more about insulin, I have a special video titled Insulin in my physiology playlist. What's the definition of hyperglycemia? Increased plasma glucose above 180 milligrams per deciliter or above 10 millimoles per liter. Of course, there is a difference between fasting serum glucose, two hours postprandial or random. I know there is a difference. This is just a general rule of thumb. Let's talk about the causes, risk factors, and precipitating factors of hyperglycemia. If I have type 1 diabetes, especially if I have diabetic ketoacidosis, my blood sugar is going to rise, of course. How about type 2 diabetes, especially if I have a hyperosmolar, hyperglycemic, non-ketotic syndrome? I will also have hyperglycemia. The main difference between these two is that ketoacidosis is more common here, whereas ketoacidosis is less likely here. Be careful, I am not saying that it's impossible for type 2 to develop ketosis. I did not say that. It's just that ketosis and ketoacidosis is more common in type 1 compared to type 2. What else? Gestational diabetes. See my obstetrics and gynecology playlist, where I talked about this topic in detail.
You can also download my obstetrics and gynecology course on my website, medicosisperfectionalis.com. Can medications raise blood sugar? Of course. Famously, we have glucocorticoids, which is similar to cortisol. It's going to raise the blood sugar. Because we just said that cortisol, just like glucagon, is catabolic. It breaks down glycogen into glucose. It breaks down proteins into amino acids. And some of these amino acids are going to give us glucose. Hashtag gluconeogenesis. Paraneoplastic syndromes. Small cell lung cancer can make ACTH. ACTH is going to stimulate the adrenal cortex. And the adrenal cortex is going to make more cortisol. And the cortisol is going to raise the blood sugar. Cushing's for the same reason. It makes lots of cortisol. Glucagonoma is a tumor in the pancreas that makes lots of glucagon. And glucagon is going to raise the blood sugar. Infections, stress... All of these conditions can trigger diabetic ketoacidosis in patients with type 1 diabetes, which can lead to severe hyperglycemia. To understand the clinical features of hyperglycemia, let me tell you about the pathogenesis of diabetic ketoacidosis. These patients usually have type 1 diabetes, and in type 1 diabetes, I do not have insulin. Recall that insulin is the major anti-ketogenic hormone. So without insulin, guess what's going to happen? I get ketone bodies. Lots of ketone bodies is called ketosis. When they are extremely high, they cause ketoacidosis, which is a high anion gap metabolic acidosis. One of the functions of insulin, may he rest in peace, was to push glucose into the cell, into the cell. But without insulin, I cannot push glucose into the cell, and therefore glucose will stay in the blood, raising the blood sugar. Also, another function of insulin, may he rest in peace, was to push potassium into the cell. But without insulin, we cannot do that. Potassium is not going to go into the cell. Potassium will stay in the blood, raising the serum potassium. That was step number one. Step number two, thanks to the hyperglycemia or increased glucose in the blood, this stinking glucose is osmotically active. It is going to pull water out of the cell by osmosis. Why? Because we have more glucose outside the cell compared to inside the cell. So, osmosis goes from low concentration of the solute to high concentration of the solute. So, from low glucose concentration to high glucose concentration, the direction of osmosis is from the inside to the outside. Now, we have tons of water outside in the blood. And when you increase the denominator, which is water, guess what's going to happen? You're going to decrease the ratio. What's the name of that ratio? Serum sodium concentration. Because any concentration is amount over volume. If you increase the volume of water in the blood, you're going to dilute the sodium in the blood. And this condition is termed dilutional hyponatremia. Decreased serum sodium concentration because of the water dilution. Next, all of this hyperglycemia, all of that extra glucose in the blood, eventually will get filtered through the kidney. Still, glucose is osmotically active. It pulls water with it. Tons of water is falling into the urine with the glucose. This causes polyuria or increased urine volume. Tons of glucose will end up in the urine, glucosuria. The extra glucose and water in the urine are going to pull some sodium with them. So I lose some sodium in the urine and develop hypovolemia or extracellular fluid volume depletion. When I lose all of that water in the urine, do you think I'll get thirsty? Of course I will. Polydipsia. When I lose all of that sugar in the urine, do you think I'll get hungry? Of course I will. Polyphagia. When I lose all of that water in the urine, what's going to happen to my urine volume? Increases. Polyuria. Anytime you have hyponatremia or hypernatremia, what's going to happen? Altered mental status. Mental status abnormalities because sodium problems cause CNS problems. So we're going to expect blurry vision, headache, difficulty concentrating. All of these are mental status abnormalities from the hyponatremia. They could also be from the hyperglycemia itself. Polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, as we said. When you lose sugar in the urine, you're losing calories in the urine. When you lose volume in the urine, you're also losing some body weight. Because about two-thirds of your body weight is made of water. The more water you lose, the lower your body weight becomes on the long run. Glucose is important for metabolism when you lose tons of glucose. And when you have diabetes and your proteins break down, you get delayed wound healing. Thanks to the ketosis, I get fruit-odored breath. My breath smells like fruit, thanks to the acetone, which is one of the ketone bodies. And that's why it ends in own.
Tons of ketones are going to cause ketoacidosis, which will lead to metabolic acidosis. And anytime you have metabolic acidosis or acidosis in general, one of the protective mechanisms to neutralize the acidosis is to get rid of the acid. How do I get rid of the acid? How about getting rid of the acid in the stomach by vomiting, which eliminates the acid and mitigates the acidosis. See, medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. How can we diagnose such a disease? Clinically, look for history, signs and symptoms. Review the medications that the patient is taking. Next, measure the blood glucose, such as the fasting blood sugar and the oral glucose tolerance test. You can also measure random blood glucose. Measure the hemoglobin A1c, which tells you about the status of the patient's blood sugar over the past three months, roughly. You can measure insulin and C-peptide, you can measure glucagon, and you can measure the ketone bodies in the blood and in the urine. And if you suspect glucagonoma or small cell lung cancer, you can do imaging. How can we treat hyperglycemia? First, treat the underlying cause. Next, better diet, exercise. Because I'm losing tons of water in the urine, hydrate and correct the electrolytes. If I have hyponatremia, correct it. If I have hyperkalemia, correct it. Give insulin. And when you give insulin, not only are you going to push glucose into the cell, but you're also going to push potassium into the cell, which can lead to hypokalemia if you're not careful. So we give insulin with potassium. Besides insulin, we can give oral glucose lowering agents such as metformin. There is also the GLP-1 agonists such as semaglutide or any glutide. Ozempic is a GLP-1 agonist. Let's review hyperglycemia in one minute. The history of type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, or gestational diabetes could also be diabetic ketoacidosis. Some medications can raise blood sugar, such as glucocorticoids, perineoplastic syndrome, such as small cell lung cancer, Cushing's, glucagonoma, infections, stress, excessive carbohydrate intake, and lack of physical activity. Symptoms and physical exam findings, polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, headache, blurry vision, xerostomia, xeroderma, dry mouth, dry skin, itching, weight loss, delayed wound healing, difficulty concentrating and paying attention, fruit odored breath from the acetone, nausea, and vomiting. Diagnose it clinically and you measure the hemoglobin A1c and the blood sugar. You can measure insulin and glucagon and ketones as well. CT scan for the tumors. Treatment. Treat the underlying cause, better diet and exercise, hydrate, correct the electrolytes, give insulin and potassium, oral glucose lowering agents and GLP-1 agonists. Do you want to learn about the different types of insulin and how to calculate the dose of insulin? Do you want to learn about thyroxine, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, dihydrotestosterone, and more? Download my endocrine pharmacology course at medicosisperfectionalis.com. To learn about all the drama that takes place in your kidneys, proximal tubules, loop of Henle, distal tubules, collecting ducts, and more, download my kidney physiology course at medicosisperfectionalis.com. My courses come with videos, notes, and cases. If you value what I do, help me make more videos by supporting the channel. Channel. Go to buymeacoffee.com slash medicosis. There are more than 700 premium videos available on this channel when you click the join button and choose the highest tier. Please subscribe, hit the bell, smash like, support my channel on Patreon, PayPal, or Venmo. Go to my website to download my courses, notes, and cases, or if you would like me to personally tour you. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine, chemistry, math, and physics make perfect sense.